Uh, I'm Deborah Stein, and uh, I organized this really as more of a conversation than a formal uh, paper. I'm just back um, two days ago from the field in uh, Mundu, and um, the title should read Swing Ships and Camel Motels When 15th Century uh, Architecture is Thought in Mundu. Um, or uh, alternatively, architecture as thought in Mundu. And so what I'm interested in when I'm showing you these slides today is uh, more about our methods of how we're gonna think about this architecture. So this is coming out of a larger book project, which is my second project. Oh, hang on, I'm gonna start my timer. <laughs> which is my second uh, book project. Uh, which grew out of the first. My first just came out. It's um, the Hegemony of Heritage, Ritual, and the Record in Stone. It came out this spring. Um, largely focused on Northwestern India. It's a diachronic study which focuses on four specific time periods, um, including the 10th century when the temples were made, uh, the so-called Sultanate period, uh, when things were largely cler clergy oriented, the 15th century, which is when uh, what most kind of contemporary and nationalist imaginaries of Rajasthan and Mewar and all these things, when those kind of mythologies and imaginaries are really um, born and solidified, and then um, the present when these temples are used and reused. So that was the last one. So this next work is going to focus primarily on the 15th century. And as part of that, some of you I know may have seen at AXA when I presented on um, the Nimat Nama. And so I went on the trail of the architecture of the place um, where, um, and the patron where the Nimat Nama was made. So we're gonna be looking primarily today at three sites um, from Mandu, which is the area where the Nimat Nama um, manuscript and etiquette manual is made, and we'll look at one or two of those images. Um, the three uh, places that we're going to look at are the Hindola Mahal, um, the Jahaz Mahal, um, which are the two most famous ones, and then two pieces of basically rubble in trees, which aren't that exciting to look at, but are very interesting. And these are the Caravan Sarai, um, the camel motels, which really um, tie into the panel in terms of um, mobility. So the Hindola Mahal, um, some of you may have taught in your surveys. It's very well known. It's been um, published extensively in art histories and architectural uh, histories, again, were in uh, the 15th century, so the 1400s, in Malwa, which is on a plateau um, in northwestern India, uh, south of Mewar, around Udaipur. So this is about 90 kilometers from Indore, and we're looking at an entire um, kind of palace city with amazing waterworks. So you can see there's three kind of basic niches there and it looks like a swing. And so at first I was thinking about this in terms of the question of, okay, what kind of metaphors, like when I wrote the abstract for this, what kind of metaphors is architecture um, making? And is, uh, is the architect making that metaphor? Is it coming from the patron? Um, and, and is it intention or reception? And is that metaphor something that gets projected onto it later or at its point of origin? And is metaphor really the way to understand architecture in the first place? So the title of this, Hindola Mahal, obviously evokes a swing, right? You can see the architecture itself. If you look at the bottom um, image there in, um, in the right-hand corner, you can see the angle of these, which is flattened in the way that we normally see it in that frontal image there. That makes it actually look in real life when you're there like there's movement in this architecture. So um, that makes us think, okay, Hindola Mahal, it evokes all of these things. So swing in India, most of you um, may know, um, even c contemporary, but also historically evokes the idea of uh, multi-sensory experience. So in Mewar, the Tej festival is really big. People are swinging on swings um, as part of a ritual in a certain time of year, at a certain time of day. 
um, in a certain context that I won't get into here. Um, Rod Mala painting, many of you are familiar with. So when many of us look at this architecture, we'll have synesthesia and we'll hear um, the music of Hindola Raga when we see that. Um, I don't know if the, will it go? I tried to embed this. I'm not very good at this element of things. And we can hardly hear it. Anyway, we can, um, we can come back to that. But um, that's one thing that we might look at. But from a different perspective, uh, then when I got there on, uh, on site, which is something that really happens with pre-modern architectural historians and art historians all the time, is that what you see in the field is very different from what you think you're going to see or what you study in the books or what you would assume from, um, from uh, just looking at photographs. So here you're looking at the mosque in front of um, Hosheng Shah's tomb, um, the predecessor to the one who, um, who sponsored the uh, Nimat Nama manuscript and the Hindola Mahal that we were just looking at. Um, and you can see those angles there are part of that architecture before it's in a swing-like context. So you have to ask, okay, well, maybe metaphor is not the right methodology for this, and we're kind of projecting onto that. And it really is just a quotation of a predecessor in a way that kind of reifies power. The second um, uh, piece of architecture that I looked at is uh, the, one of the most famous, um, and yet really kind of under visited and worked upon these days, uh, very popular a hundred years ago to look at. And you can see, I love on these uh, modern Sheila Lake here and these uh, inscriptions, the story about it, noted for romantic beauty. Um, uh, it resembles a ship and it was probably built by the pleasure loving Sultan for his large harem. So that's the kind of common tourist language around it. I expected this like the Hindola Mahal from pictures. This is harder to get good pictures of historically and in the present. I expected it to be a metaphor. So I expected it to look like a ship and I expected it to be a metaphor for mobility, which is why I put it there um, akin to camel motels, which I'll get to in a sec. But when I got there, I felt like it actually functioned like a ship instead of looking like a ship. So when you're on this, it kind of feels like what you would imagine a cruise ship would be like. And so you're here in the middle, and on either side, you have waters. And so this um, city is an amazing 15th century feat of hydro of um, hydro engineering, and that would be a whole other book that you could get into. But you have these um, different pools of water on either side, and you have water being pumped up to the top of this. So here you're at the stern of the ship. This is what it's like when you're inside the ship. It feels like you're looking down on it. And there you see the water pool without water in it now, but with a hydraulic system that can bring water up several levels onto that. So this um, pool here was very popular in terms of um, modernist photography, and I can get to that in the question and answer period. Usually it's shot like this for its fabulous geometry, but I think it's much interest, more interesting to try to think about this as living heritage. Now, how do you think of living heritage? If something's in the 15th century, it's not in a continual usage, you're not being flown there by a sultan to speak at a heritage con convention, and it's an archaeological site. And I think the way you can do that is not through text and image, and you've already noticed this lecture is super Warburg-y um, and image heavy, but you can do that through um, image and image. And so I'm interested in the relationship between architecture and painting. Here you're looking at something from the Nimat Nama, and with that, instead of looking at metaphor, or architecture, you can start to look at um, really kind of intimate, uh, multi-sensory things from everyday life. Like, what did the body smell like when they were in that pool in the 15th century? Uh, what did they eat for poolside snacks? Deer meat samosa with camphor. Mm. <laughs> Venison eaters in the audience, anyone? Mm -hmm. Look at those, look at that tile behind him. Keep looking. 
Okay, last one. I think I have another 45 seconds. A camel motel. So then you hike into the middle of the field and you see what nobody's photographing. Gee, I wonder why. How are you going to get your art history pu monograph published when you're looking at rubble in a bunch of weeds? Um, maybe if you make it kind of jungly, no, that would be too colonial, but I did taste this fruit. It was pretty fabulous. Um, so you're looking here at an extensive one. And what you can do, even despite the lack of visual luster, per se, is you can count the number of these. And so you can see how big was it. So when I flew Emirates, I was on a two-floor plane where they lost my luggage with over 700 passengers. No, I wasn't in business class, even though it was a business trip. <laughs> and I, you can get a sense of it the same thing. So how big was your jumbo jet? That's how you can read these monuments. How many camels did they have? Where were they coming from? It's like waypoints on your GPS. To finish up, here's your plateau that you're on. This is why it's a safe area. Here's the two famous ones. Woot, woot. Are we doing metaphor or are we doing daily life of living heritage? And I want to close with this which is the most famous caravanserai, or camel motel, as I'm calling them, to kind of de-exoticize the idea. Like, when you think of a caravan and a camel, it's just like very mm, orientalist, right? So let's just think of it as a motel. And you see here the last slide where you have the floor of that camel motel. Sometimes what we're looking at in a manuscript, here's the Nemat Mamet there on the floor, is really just what you see. Right? Roysdale's Horizon, for the art historians in the audience, is down here. And if you look out the train in Holland, that's what the horizon is. So maybe it's not about exotic patterning and Islamic exoticism, but maybe in Herat and there, and in the Timurid world, this is really what the titles look like. Thank you. Done. Thank you.